Now, how about you? You've been through the first week of experiencing God. You got your work much. You've been working right. And you memorized that memory verse. Right? Who has the memory verse memorized? Or you feel like you got it memorized? Three and a half hands. Okay, I'm going to try it. If you think you've got it, say it along with me. It's John 15, 5. I'm the vine. You are the branches. Without you. If you abide in me, right, and I abide in you, you'll bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Hey, y'all didn't do too bad for the first week. But now you know that I'm going to do that again next week. So work on it. I mean, I was up here stumbling myself, right? But that sounded pretty good. And y'all, But here's the thing. Y'all kind of get the gist of that, and that's the important part. So we're in this first week of experiencing God, and I hope that you've already been challenged with some of the truths that, that you're learning on your own, and that really you're not learning it on your own. What you're doing is you're getting all everybody out of the way, and it's you and the Holy Spirit. And as you're reading this book and working through this workbook, you're praying and you're asking the Holy Spirit to speak to you and to show you the truths that He's wanting show you. And I hope that that's happened for you already. It's only going to get more challenging. It's going to get better. And it's going to continue to be a blessing. So uh, keep doing what you're doing. I was sharing with the young people this morning that it's important to try to do, uh, you know, you have five lessons a week and you have seven days in in a week. It's important to space them out because once you go through one day, You want to spend some time just letting that kind of get into your heart. What did I learn? What does that mean for me? And God might really challenge you. You might have to think about that and pray about that. So try to do all five days and try to put them a little bit spaced out so that you can appreciate each day what the Lord is teaching you. And uh, that'll be a blessing to you. And so today, I want to share with you the keys to experiencing God. And we're going to get into that, but first I want to pray that we'll open our hearts and and be open to receive what God has to teach us this morning. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful to be here. And Father, we're so grateful that you have brought us together to do the study together called Experiencing God. And Father, I know that it's challenging and I know it's going to teach us some things that maybe we've not even thought about before. And so Father, as we review this first week... I just pray that our hearts would be open to receive and to understand what it is that you're saying to us through this study and through your word. And so, Father, guide us as we get the word together this morning. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so the, the goal of this study is not to complete a study. The goal of this study is to experience God. There's a difference. Anybody can complete any kind of study, start to finish. But the goal of this study is for you to have a transforming encounter with God. And so in today's message, I want to show you four keys that we looked at this week uh, to experiencing God. Four keys to discovering God's will, to get involved in God's work so that you can experience God's power in your life. So let's jump right in. The first key is this. Jesus is your way. Jesus is your way. You cannot experience God apart from Christ. Hey, you can experience good things. You can do good things. You can uh, have a life that you feel is is good and pleasing to you, but, but you can't experience God apart from Jesus Christ. There's no way that you can do that. And, and that's why our key verse this week is John 15, 5. I'm the vine, you're the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he'll bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. That's Jesus speaking. And he's saying, apart from me, you're not going to experience God. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Now, sure, we can do things. But he's talking about spiritual things, lasting things, eternal things. That's what Jesus is talking about. And I like 1 Corinthians 2.14. Listen to this. It says, but the natural man, the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God for their foolishness to him. 
nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. So what that teaches us there is apart from a relationship with Jesus Christ, you cannot know spiritual things that's given through the Spirit of God. It says that a person that doesn't know Christ, when they look at the things of God, it seems like foolishness to them. And through Christ, the Holy Spirit is going to be your teacher. Jesus told the disciples that last night before he was nailed to the cross, he had his disciples together in the upper room. They had that last supper together, and he told them many things. And that's what I love about John, is John really recorded all those chapters of what Jesus said. And one of the things he said is this, John 14, 26. He says, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring you to remembrance of all things I said to you. So through Christ, we get this teacher, the Holy Spirit. And this teacher will always be teaching us what Christ said and what it means in our life. And then we have the scriptures. And you know the scriptures, and in some of the older Bibles, you don't see as much nowadays, but in some of the older Bibles, when you opened up to the title page of the Old Testament, you know what it would say? It would say the Old Testament of Jesus Christ. And then you turn to the title page of the New Testament, it'd say the New Testament of Jesus Christ. So the Word of God is really all about Jesus Christ. Is, is Christ in the Old Testament uh, predestined to come, uh, prophesied to come, and it's Christ in the New Testament where He comes. And so everything about the Bible is about the, the way, Jesus. Jesus says, I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the light. No man comes to the Father but by me. And that's why the first key to experiencing God is that Jesus is your way. You will not experience God apart from Christ. Psalms 119, referring to the scripture, says this. It says, forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. What I love about that verse is it tells me how, how true God's word is. It's not only settled on earth, it's not only printed for us to hold in our hands, but it's settled in heaven. And what, what should we put our faith in and our trust in? Not our feelings. Our feelings will deceive us. You know what? If you've got a job and you wake up in the morning and say, you know what? I just don't feel like going to work today. You might lose that job. Your feelings can get you in trouble. So we cannot trust our feelings. We can't trust our traditions because some traditions are true and some aren't. We can't trust personal experiences completely. I think they're important, but you can't, you can't build a philosophy of belief about God on personal experience. And you can't build it on the experience of others. What you need to build it on is the truth and the fact and the authoritative evidence of God's word, the Bible. John 17, 17 says this. It says, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. He's talking about all this. Sanctify them. That was Jesus. And that was his prayer that last night on earth. He was praying for his disciples, and he was praying for everybody that would come after his disciples. And he prayed those words. He says, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. And so God's word, the testimony of Christ, must be our source of authority. We need a source of authority. You should be in it daily and let it speak to you. Every day we should have this relationship with God that every day we're in prayer and we're in the Word. When we pray, we're speaking to Him. When we read His Word, He's speaking to us. That's a conversation that we can have with the Holy Father every day. So Jesus is your way. Key number two, Jesus is also your model. In other words, He shows you what it looks like. If you ask the wrong question... You'll get the wrong answer. That was one of the things that really got me in the study this week. If I ask the wrong question, I'll get the wrong answer. And it says this. It says the question is not what is God's will for me. The question is what is God's will? See, too many of us live that self-centered life. I'm the center of the universe. Everything revolves around me. God, what is your will for my life? God, why is my life going this way? 
And that's the wrong question. And through your feelings and through your emotions and through your experiences, you'll keep giving yourself the wrong answer and you'll build a whole philosophy on it. You might be one of those people that say, oh, God don't care about me. Or you might be someone that says, you know what? I don't believe in God because if, if there was a God, he wouldn't let this and this and this and this happen. And so we get into all these realities when we're asking that question, what is God's will for me? Listen, this world doesn't revolve around me. Everything revolves around God. Our question needs to be, God, what is your will? And help me to do it. Turn to John chapter 5 with me and let's look at some scripture. I'm going to start reading in verse 17. And I want you to see just a few verses here and then we're going to look. This is Jesus' example of how we're to pursue God and his will. It says, but Jesus answered them. My father has been working until now, and I have been working. And then look at verse 19. Then Jesus answered and said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of himself but what he's seen the father do. For whatever he does, the son does it in like manner. For the father loves the son and shows himself all things that he himself does, and he will show him even greater works than these that you may marvel. Now let's look at uh, Jesus' example there. First in 17, here he says, number one, he says, the Father's been working right up until now. Listen, the Father's been working before time. The Father was working before he created this world. What was he doing? I don't know the answer to that, but I know he's always been working. He worked to create this universe, to create this planet, to create you and me, and he's working right up until now. That's what Jesus said. Then number two, Jesus says, now the Father has me working. He says, my Father has been working unto now, and I have been working. So the Father's working, and Jesus is working. Then number three, he says, I do nothing on my own initiative. This is what Jesus said. I do nothing on my own initiative. He says, uh, most assuredly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself. And then he says, number four, I watch to see what the Father's doing. And we see there in the verse, it says, but what he sees the father do uh, for whatever he does, the son does in like manner. And so that brings us to number five. He said, basically, he's saying, I do what the father does. And then number six, he says, the father loves me. And number seven, he says, he shows me everything he's doing. Now, that was Jesus' example of how he worked in this world. And so I want to... Go through that again. I want you to think of your life. I want you to think about how you pursue God. And I want you to ask yourself, is this how I pursue God? We know God's at work. Okay, number one, we all got that check. But now, are we working? The Father's working, are we working? And then the third one, I do nothing on my own initiative. How many people want to tell God what they're willing to do for you? Hey, God, let me tell you what I'm going to do for you this week. You know why we want to tell God what we'll do and feel good about ourselves? Because then the rest of the time it's theirs to do whatever we want to do. But what if we want to do what God is doing and get involved in that work? And he says, well, if you want to do this, you don't have time for all that. You've got to give that up. See, it's easier to tell God what we'll do for him than to do what God would ask us to do. Number four, I watch to see what the Father's doing. You know, that's a, that's a game of patience right there. When's the last time you just said, you know what, I'm not going to do anything until I see what the Father's doing. Then I'm going to do that. And then it says, I do what I see the Father doing. Now that's a challenge right there because it may require too much of our time. It may require too much of our skills. It may require too much of our money. Mm, I, I'd rather tell you what I want to do for you, God, instead of doing what I see you do. And then he says, the Father loves me and he shows me everything he's doing. I believe the Father loves us. And I believe he wants us to see what he's doing because he wants to accomplish his work through us. And we're going to look at that next. But that's Jesus' example. Key number three, learn to be a servant of God. Here's where it's getting tougher. You've got to learn to be a servant of God. Turn to Jeremiah 18. And I want you to see a potter. Jeremiah 18, verses 1 through 6. I'm going to read it. You follow along. Here's what it said. It says, The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house, 
and there I will cause you to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house, and there he was making something at the wheel. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter, so he could make it again into another vessel, as it seemed good to the potter to make. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as the potter, says the Lord? Look, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. Now here's the context of that story. Jeremiah was a prophet in that day, and God was about to deal out some justice to the house of Israel, because they wasn't where he wanted them to be. And he tells the prophet who then... You know, a prophet gets a word from the Lord and then takes it to the people. And so this was the word from the Lord that the prophet got, Jeremiah. And he says, go and tell them that I'm the potter and you're the clay. You know, that's a hard thing to receive. We want to, we want to live our lives our way. We want to do it our way. We want to tell God what we will do for him, but we don't want him to interrupt the parts of our life that we don't want to do for him. And so this is what was going on in Israel, and they were displeasing God, disobeying God, not walking with God, not allowing God to work through them. And he says, listen, Jeremiah, you need to let them know I'm the potter and they're the clay. Now, what does that mean? Well, I'll tell you, when I was 18 years old, I lived in Cartersville, Georgia, and there was a famous potter there, a world-famous potter named W.J. Gordy. And W.J. Gordy was old at that time, and, and I was a young, budding artist, and, and I was into any kind of art I could get into, and somebody mentioned him to me and said, you know what, he's a nice guy. If you call and ask him, he'll let you come up there and watch him work. I said, well, I'll do that. So I called Mr. Gordy, and he says, yeah, come on up. And I went up there to his studio, and I watched him work. This world-class, world-famous potter has pottery in the Smithsonian Institution. And I watched him work, and, and I literally saw this story play out. He was sitting there, and he was making a base. And as he got it almost done, he just mashed it all down. And he took the whole lump of clay... And he took it and he threw it in this big barrel that he called the pit. And in that barrel, it stayed until he got ready to try something else with it. But here's the thing that I learned and what Jeremiah was learning about the potter and the clay is that to be a servant of God, you must be like clay in his hands. You must be like, and think about this. The clay has to be moldable. In other words, if we're clay in God's hands, we need to be responsive to God. We, a clay, clay can't say, you know, I will be a, a bowl for you. No, it's the potter that decides what you're going to be. And you have to be responsive. That clay was not responding correctly. And Mr. Gordy just smashed it down, pulled it off the wheel, threw it in the pit. And I said, well, well what do you do? He says, I'll, that'll sit there and soak for maybe two weeks or a month because it's just not right yet. And you know, sometimes God will put our lives on hold. And sometimes He's saying to us, you know, you're just not right yet and you need to just stop and realize that I want you to be clay in my hands and I want you to let me mold you and make you into what I want you to be. But so many people want to argue with God that it makes us too rigid. We're not responsive. And he just takes us off the wheel and says, boom, when you get ready, I'll come back to you. When you're ready, I'll come back to you. That's what the potter is to the clay. The clay has to be moldable. Not only that, but the clay has to remain in the potter's hands. Clay can't mold itself. We think we can. We think we can decide what we're going to be for God. We think we can decide what we're going to do, how much time we'll give Him. But we need to be in the potter's hands. We need to be, in other words, surrendered to God. And then the last part of that is that the clay can do nothing on its own. Like I say, clay can't mold itself. The potter wants to do his work in the clay. The potter wants to do his work in your life. And so you need to quit trying to do it all on your own and say, God, you show me and I'll respond to you. I don't know how many of y'all watched it, but Susan and I watched the whole series of Downton Abbey. 
And that's an interesting story where you see both sides of that reality. It's, it's late 18th century, early, early 19th century time frame. And you have this very rich family. And they have all these servants. And the, they show in the servants end of the story. And they're showing the families end of the story. And it's all intertwined together. But I learned something from watching that show about what it means to be a servant. See, a servant is not somebody like, say if I'm a servant to a king, I'm going to go up to the king every day and say, hey king, it's me, it's Barry, I'm going to serve you today, what do you want me to do? Let me shine your shoes, king, let me clean your car, let me, let me help you get that robot and just drive it in nuts. That's not what a servant does. And on that show, Downton Abbey, they all was downstairs around the table, hanging out, enjoying fellowship with each other, eating, you know, just being who they are, waiting for the master to call, waiting for the bell to ring. If he didn't call and that bell didn't ring, they just sat there and enjoyed life and waited until they were called on. But once they were called on, once the master sent that call, then they jumped up and they went to that master's side. And the servant would do whatever the master asked them to do. Now, we're talking about learning to be a servant. Think about your relationship with God. You want to always tell Him what you're willing to do for Him? Or you want to ask Him to let you know when He needs you to do something for Him? And then when God calls you, are you willing to do whatever He asks? Sometimes that might be very challenging. A servant serves at the Master's bidding. And the right question is, what is the master's will? The last key is this. God works through his servants. So we, be, we begin in Christ. We follow Christ's model. We learn to be a servant to God. And when we get there, then God will work through us. God will work through his servants. And in, in our human nature, it's easy to misunderstand how God works. A lot of people think God works like this. They go, well, you pray and you say, God, what would you have me to do? And you think he gives you assignment and then you go off and try to fulfill that assignment. And if you get in any trouble, you're going to pray and ask God to step in and help you get through the trouble. And then you'll keep on going with the assignment. That's not how it works, but that's how many of us think it works. Oh, God asked me to do this. I'm going to do this to the best of my ability. I'm going to get it done. If I get in trouble, I can pray and God will answer my prayer because I know he asked me to do this. And the truth of the matter is that that's not even biblical. It's not even biblical. When God is about to do something, He has to get you from where you are to where He is. Think about Downton Abbey. The servants are down in the lower part of the house. When, when the master wants the servant to do something, He has to get them from where they are to where He is. And that takes some work. And, and not only that, he, he has to show us what he's doing. And then he shows us what he needs us to do. So we're totally dependent on him showing us, on him guiding us, on him leading us. And then we need to join our life into God's activity. What is God doing? That's what we need to be doing. And when, when God invites us into an activity that He's doing, when He calls us from where we are to get to where He is, that's a very challenging reality. And that's where you have a crisis of faith, a crisis of belief, because you have to ask yourself, am I really willing to go with God? And there are so many people that their spiritual lives are stagnant. Because at some point in their life, God wanted them to do something with Him that He could work through them. And they said, no, God, I'll give you everything, but I won't give you that. And that's where it ended. And that potter took that clay off the wheel. Cost him. All right. When you get moldable, I'll work with you again. When I accepted my call to preach in February of 2008, I said, Lord, I will do whatever you ask me to do. I'll go wherever you ask me to go. And I surrendered my heart and life to him. And he immediately started giving me opportunities to go and serve. I was, I was, going, I was a chaplain at 
Fulton County Jail. I was I was going in and doing a, a Bible study group at a homeless shelter in downtown Atlanta. It's about that time that we went through this study of spirits and God. And not long after we went through this study, Susan and I, the spirits and God, a few months later, a, a church called me to be their pastor. And then from there, I served at several churches. I ended up being a youth pastor at a, a church in Marietta. And God blessed that ministry abundantly. Here's what I'm saying to you is that every time God called us to where he was at and we just uprooted and went, he blessed abundantly. And he blessed that youth ministry abundantly. And, and, and you know, all that time, I, I recall back when that first church asked me to be their pastor, I, I had not been to seminary. And, and I said, but God, I haven't even been to seminary. And here's what God spoke clearly to my heart. He says, don't worry about it. I'll take care of that. When the time is right. All right. I'll go Lord. I'll trust you and I'll go. Because you're calling me to be where you're at. And he blesses at that church. And then he blesses in all these ministries. And then uh, we was in the youth ministry. And it was amazing. It, it was a joy. And then he, he spoke in my heart. And he says okay Barry. I'm done with you in this youth ministry. And it was a thriving ministry. That other churches was copying us. And. And I was speaking here and there and yonder, and, and God was using it. But yet, He's like, it's time for you to, to leave. And out of obedience again, I'm like, you know what? I'm, I'm, the, I'm the clay. He's the potter. I'm the servant. He's the master. If He's saying, leave, we leave. And, and we left there, and then He started opening up doors for me to go and speak on regional. I, he had me go and speak in California on youth ministry. I thought, wow, this is it. I'm just going to become the youth ministry guru for God. And while I was out there, I got invited to preach at a church out there. And I went and preached, didn't think anything about it. And a few weeks later, the church contacted me, and they said, we're interested in you as our pastor. And man, you talk about a crisis of belief. That was a crisis of belief for me to think that I was going to leave Georgia to go to California. And, it, and I said, well, I'll pray about that. And a few weeks later, they called me back again and they said, we want you to be our pastor. I said, you know, I, I've never even been to seminary. They said, well, don't worry about that because we've decided Golden Gate is right on our doorstep. We decided we're going to pay for you to go to seminary. And the Holy Spirit said, Cha-ching, <laughs> I told you when the time is right, I would take care of that. And I'm ashamed to say that I said no. I said no. Churches can be ugly. Churches can hurt your feelings. And I'm not going to uproot my family to go to California and be hurt. And you know what he did? And I was there for quite a few years. And you know how I, I cannot express the regret that I have to this day over saying no to God. There's no way to express it. He's forgiven me, but I lost something that I'll never be able, I'll never know what he might have done through me. He's, he's finally using us again. I, honestly, I feel like being here has been the first opportunity he's given me since then. And that's been a few years ago. Listen, God doesn't need me. God doesn't need you. Somebody else became the pastor of that church, I'm sure. And they did just fine. But what did he want to do through us? And I give no fault to my dear wife Susan. I made that decision. And I really didn't even say much about it. I guess I share that story with you because, number one, I want you to feel how hard it can hurt when you say no to God. 
And, and to know that until I said no, it was like everything he invited us to do was such an amazing blessing. And that's what he wants to do for you today. And that's what he's doing for us today. I'm so thankful to be here. I'm so thankful to be up preaching again. Now he let me preach after that. I got invited to preach, but I knew I was on a shelf. And I knew that, and I went through a lot of a lot of challenging times because of that decision. So the point is this, is that if you want to experience God, number one, you've got to have a relationship with Christ. Number two, you've got to let Christ be your model. Number three, you've got to learn how to be a servant. And then God will work in you and through you to accomplish what he's doing. And so I don't know where you're at today. I, I wasn't, I had absolutely no intention of sharing that testimony. It's very personal to me, and, and I don't know if I've ever even shared it publicly before, but there you have it. But God put it strongly on my heart, so maybe somebody here needs to hear what it feels like when you say no to God. Maybe somebody here today is trying to understand all of this and you don't even have a relationship with God. Well, today is the day of salvation. Today is the day that you can come forward and pray and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior if you don't know Him. And if you do know Him, maybe you realize through this message today that you've been thinking wrong. You've made yourself the the center of the universe. You've said, I'll do this for you, God. When God said, no, I, I just want you to serve me. I just want you to be available. So where are you today? I want to ask Louise to come with us on an invitation. And if you have a need to respond to this message, I want you to just come forward in response. You can speak with me. We can pray together. You can just come to this altar and pray. Whatever God is speaking to your heart, if you need to respond today, I invite you to do so as we sing.